Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Mrs. Bray Reads a Story. So today we're going to be continuing on with the Brambley Hedge Treasury, and we're going to be looking at the second story in the book. So if you haven't already listened to the first story, I'd recommend going back and looking at that Brambley Hedge Part 1 video. So this one is called The Secret Staircase. This one is definitely one of my favorite videos, or videos, excuse me, favorite stories in the Brambley Hedge. Um, I've always really liked this one. So The Secret Staircase. So once again, um, because there's a lot of words and not as many pictures in this one, I'll read the pages first and then I'll show you guys the pictures afterwards. Okay. So The Secret Staircase. It was a frosty morning. The air was crisp and cold and everything sparkled in the winter sunshine. The little mice hurried along and the path turned up. Let's try this again. The air was crisp and cold and everything sparkled in the winter sunshine. The little mice hurrying along the path turned up their collars and blew on their paws as in an effort to keep them warm. Merry midwinter called Dusty Dogwood, scurrying past Mr. Apple and the Toad Flax children with a huge covered basket. Mr. Apple and his children were busy too, dragging great sprays of holly and trails of ivy and mistletoe towards Old Oak Palace. When they arrived at the gates, they heaped all of the branches on the ground and Wilfred tugged on the bell. So there's the pictures and uh, you can see there's Dusty Dogwood and he's running past uh, the other family with the branches of holly over there. Lord Woodmouse and Primrose, his daughter, opened the door. Here we are, said Mr. Apple, mopping his face. Do you want it all inside? Yes, please, said Lord Woodmouse. We'll start decorating the stairs. Eagerly, the children pushed the branches over the polished um, palace floors and skidded their way along to the great hall. Are you two ready for tonight? asked Lord Woodmouse. Primrose and Wilfred exchanged glances. That evening, after dark, all the mice would gather round a blazing fire for the traditional midwinter celebrations. A grand entertainment was planned, and Primrose and Wilfred had been chosen to give a recitation. Almost, said Primrose, but we still have got to practice and we need proper costumes. You'd better see your mother about those, replied her father. You can practice wherever you like. Okay. So here we are in the old oak palace, and so they're getting the great hall all ready for the midwinter celebrations. And there you can see Wilfred and Primrose talking to uh, their Primrose's dad there and getting ready for their recitation. So they're going to be reading a poem at the party. Okay. Leaving Clover, Catkin, and Teasel to go back with, to the wood with Mr. Apple, Primrose and Wilfred took themselves off to a corner of the hall to begin through their lines. When the days are shortest and the nights are the coldest, began Primrose, drawing an imaginary cloak around her. Look out, you too, interrupted Basil, bustling past with some bottles. The frost is the sharpest and the year is the oldest, continued Wilfred. Mind your tails, called Poppy, rolling in a huge green cheese. This is hopeless, sighed Primrose. We can't rehearse heel. Let's go ask Mama what to do. Lady Woodmouse was busy making caraway biscuits in the kitchen. She leaned on her rolling pin, listening to Primrose's tale of woe. Why don't you see if there's something up in the attics for you to wear? You could practice up there, too. She packed a little basket with bread and cheese and a jug of blackberry juice and gently shooed the kitchen out of, children out of the kitchen. Okay, so here we have Primrose and, Primrose and Wilfred trying to practice, but not having much luck because uh, everyone's bustling around them. And here we have the children asking Mrs. Woodmouse if they are able, were they able to practice. Okay. There were a great many attic rooms in the top of Old Oak Palace. Lady Woodmouse used them to tidy away things that might be coming handy. Baby's blankets and rolls of lace, boxes of buttons, stacks of books, broken toys, patchwork quilts, pudding cloths, and old saucepans all were crammed together, higgledy-piggledy on the shelves. 
Primrose and Wilfred went from room to room looking for a suitable spot for their rehearsal. They ended up in a crowded storeroom at the end of a passage, but it was difficult to concentrate on practicing. There were so many things to look at. Standing on tiptoe, Primrose reached inside a drawer of an old wooden dresser. In it, she found some bundles of letters tied up in a pink ribbon, but she couldn't read the writing, and it's rude to read other people's letters, so she put them back. As she did so, she caught sight of a small key which had slipped down the side of the drawer. Mm. So here's uh, Primrose and Wilfred uh, looking around the attic room there, and here's here you can see Primrose as she is looking in the drawer and finds the key. Ooh, so exciting. Okay, so and then there's a nice little picture of the key there. Okay, it's a very pretty key. Look at this, Wilfred, she cried excitedly. Let's see. Oh, it's only an old key. Is it time for lunch? Primrose said nothing, but she slipped the key into her pinafore pocket before setting out their picnic on the floor. Do you think this would make a good cloak? said Wilfred with his mouth full of bread and cheese. He had seized an end of the long green curtain and was winding himself up in it. As he turned towards Primrose, he caught sight of a small door hidden behind its folds. Where does this go, Primrose? he asked. I don't know, replied Primrose, scrambling over some boxes. Does it open? Wilfred pushed. The door was locked. He peeped through the keyhole and saw another flight of stairs on the other side of the door. It's no good, he said disappointedly. We can't get in. Well, if there's a keyhole, there must be a key. And I think I have it here. She reached inside her pinafore pocket and handed the little key to Wilfred. He tried the lock. It fitted perfectly and the door swung open. So there they are, peeking past the green curtains, finding that secret door. They found themselves in a dark paneled hall at the foot of a long winding staircase. The stair carpet must have once been beautiful, but now it was tattered and covered with dust. No one can have been up here for years and years, whispered Primrose. Shall we see you at the top? Wilfred nodded, so up the stairs they went, round and round. Primrose kept close behind Wilfred. She couldn't help feeling a little nervous. Suddenly, the stairs came to an abrupt end, and they were standing in yet another hall. And there was yet another door, but this time it was huge and richly carved. They went up to it and opened it. The children stared around them in amazement. Okay. So here's a little cut, uh, cross section of Old Oak Palace. And what you can see here in the middle is the attic room where um, Wilfred and Primrose were. And then there's the door. And then there's the staircase, which is going round and round and round all the way through and up to the other hall. Okay. So cool, hey, a secret staircase. Okay. They were standing in the most magnificent room. There were columns and carvings and dark tapestries and paintings on the walls. In front of them, two golden chairs stood on a little platform. Everything in the room was covered with dust and the air smelled musty and strange. Where are we? asked Wilfred. I don't know, whispered Primrose. I've never been here before. They tiptoed across the floor, leaving little paw prints as they went. Maybe your ancestors lived here in the olden days, Primrose, said Wilfred, gazing at an imposing portrait. Let's clean it up and have it as our house, said Primrose. We could keep it secret and we could come up here to play. As she spoke, she opened a cupboard and found it full of hats. Wilfred! Look at these, they're just right for tonight. So here's the big, beautiful old hall that has been hidden for many, many years. And there's the little chairs on a platform and all of the fancy columns and paintings, all covered in dust because they've been hidden for so long. Uh, 
A door at the end of the room led into the nursery. There was a canopied cot near the window and all sorts of dust-covered toys were on the shelves. Wilfred peeped inside an ancient trunk and pulled out a little suit with a high jacket and tight braided trousers. It was almost the right size for him. Neatly befolded beneath it were dresses and cloaks, waistcoats and shawls, some trimmed with gold and others studded with shining stones. The children held them up, one after another, in each chosen outfit for the evening and tried it on. Perfect! And now we must practice! Okay. Um, let's finish exploring first, said Wilfred. So there they are in the nursery, full of all sorts of amazing fun things. And Wilfred has found the hat and they found the fun clothes. There seemed to be a whole suite of rooms. There was a dining room, a butler's pantry, a small kitchen and several other bedrooms. The bathroom was particularly grand with a tiled floor and high windows. Wilfred rubbed a mirror clean and made faces at himself, whilst Primrose leaned over um, to the side of the bath to try the taps. No water came out. When the days are the shortest and the nights are the coldest, she recited. Her voice sounded loud and echoey. Wilfred joined in and they went through their lines again and again until they were word perfect. Outside, the sun was sinking low in the frosty air and the bathroom filled with shadows. It's getting late, Primrose said. If we don't hurry, we'll miss the log. They picked up their clothes and scampered over the dusty floors to the door. So there they are in the fancy uh, bathroom with a really big window there. And they're practicing their lines. You can see they've got their fancy clothes on too. Down the stairs they ran, round and round, down and down, until they found themselves back in the storeroom. They locked the door with a little key and replaced it in the drawer. Then they crept along the corridors to Primrose's room, taking care to keep out of sight. Okay, so you can see the cross section of the the palace there, and you can see there's that's the fancy room, and then there's the staircase that they ran down and up into the attic room there. Isn't that cool? Primrose opened her window. They could just hear the caroling of the mice as the midwinter log was pulled along the hedge. There was no time to change, so they threw their cloaks on over to, um, to hide their costumes and ran to join the crowd at the palace gates. Mr. Apple and Dusty Dogwood headed the procession, lanterns held high. Roast the chestnuts, heat the wine, pass the cup along the line. Gather round, the log burns bright, it is warmest toast inside tonight, sang the mice as the long log came into view. Teasel, clover, cat and catkin were perched on a huge branch as it was dragged up the palace gates. Primrose and Wilfred scrambled up behind. Okay, so you can see there's Primrose and Wilfred as they're running along to try and catch up. And then there's the log being the, dragged into the, the big grand hall there. Okay. Mice pulled the log carefully over the threshold and Basil threw some bramble wine onto the bark. Merry Midwinter, he called amidst cheers. At last the log was here. The Midwinter celebrations could begin. A fire had been already laid in the hearth of the Great Hall and the log was rolled into it. Everyone was handed a cup of steaming punch. Old Mrs. Eyebright was to light the fire and she held up a burning taper. To summer, she announced, and Mr. Apple stooped to help her thrust the taper into the fire. To summer, echoed the mice. The bright flames licked the mossy bark and soon the log was ablaze. The mice helped themselves to supper, which was spread on a table near the fire, and Basil refilled their cups. Why don't you take your cloak off, dear? Uh, said Lady Woodmouse. It's very hot by the fire. Not just yet, Mama, said Primrose. I'm a bit, just a bit chilly. I think she's hiding her costume. I'm trying to keep her costume a surprise. Yeah, looks like they're having a fun party, eh?
When they had all eaten as much all they could, they drew up the chairs around the hearth and the entertainment began. Mr. Apple made huge shadows on the wall by standing in front of the fire. He made the shape of a weasel with a mean little eye, a snake's head, a fox, and with the aid of a curtain, a bat. The little mice squealed and laughed. Next, Basil played a jig on his fiddle and Dusty did some conjuring tricks. Then they tried to pass a crab apple right round the circle, holding it under their, under their chins. Then after that, Lord Woodmouse stole, told stirring tales of olden times. Primrose and Wilfred nudged each other. Everyone did a, tur um, did a turn until Lord Woodmouse said, And now, Primrose, what have you got for us? The children jumped up and took their places in front of the fire. Okay. So you can see they've got the, the bat with the shadow tricks and we've got some juggling Lord Woodmouse telling tales and then there's Primrose and Wilfred all covering up in their cloaks to start their poem. Midwinter when the days are the shortest and the nights are the coldest when the frost is the sharpest and the year is the oldest the sun is the weakest and the wind is the hardest the snow is the deepest, the skies are the darkest. Then polish your whiskers and tidy your nest and dress in your richest and finest and best. For winter has brought you the worst it can bring and now it will give you the promise of spring. Primrose and Wilford threw off their cloaks and donned their hats with a flourish. The audience gasped to see the beautiful clothes which sparkled in the firelight, and then clapped and cheered louder than ever. The applause went on for so long that Lord Woodmouse had to ask them to do it all over again. Yeah, so when I was little, this was my one of my favorite pictures. Yeah, you can see all the other mice um, watching Primrose and Wilfred's um, presentation of their poem. And you can see them in their fancy clothes, which are sparkling by the fire. At last, Primrose and Wilfred went back to their seats. That was wonderful, whispered Lady Woodmouse, hugging her. Wherever did you find those beautiful clothes? Primrose glanced quickly at Wilfred. In the attic, she mumbled, hoping her mother would not ask any more awkward questions. Luckily, at that moment, Basil started telling one more last story, and everyone settled down to listen. Primrose and Wilfred gazed around the fire and thought of all the lovely games they would play in their house at the top of the secret staircase. Soon their heads began to nod, and in no time, they were both fast asleep. And there they are. Okay. So I hope you really liked that story. It was always one of my favorites when I was a kid. So here is the intro for tomorrow's story, the last of the three stories of the Brambley Hedge book. Wilfred loves adventures, but usually they're imaginary ones, games that the children play near the home. However, one autumn, Wilfred was able to go on a real journey and an exciting one at that. So to tune in tomorrow where we will watch this, uh, where we'll read the story of the high hills okay we will see you tomorrow ladies and gentlemen hope you guys enjoy today's episode of mrs bray reads a story all right have a good night see you all tomorrow